Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is our third virtual public lecture in our series, Computer Science Alumni and Friends. And we're very pleased to welcome Natasha Jocks uh, back to Regina virtually. So first of all, a warm virtual welcome to members and friends of the University of Regina and its three federated colleges, the First Nations University of Canada, Campion College and Luther College. The University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands, the presence in Treaty 6 lands. These are the territories of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples from near and far. So the Department of Computer Science was uh, created in 1968 when it got final approval from the Board of Governors in November of that year. Some of the first graduates of the program convocated in 1974 as the University of Saskatchewan Regina campus became the University of Regina. And Larry Symes, who was an alumnus of the Regina campus, was the first department head. So this is our third event in our virtual public lecture series. So please uh, stay tuned for the next in the series coming in fall of 2021. We welcome your feedback and suggestions. Please send them along to me, Daryl Hepting or daryl.hepting at uregina.ca. So just for your information, for those who don't know, I'm a professor in the department and an alumnus. So a bit about our guest speaker tonight, Natasha holds a joint position as a research scientist at Google Brain and a postdoc at UC Berkeley. She received her PhD from MIT, where she focused on effective computing and new techniques for deep reinforcement and machine learning. She has a master's degree from UBC and a bachelor's, bachelor of science in computer science and a BA in psychology from the University of Regina. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Natasha for a talk about social reinforcement learning. Thank you so much. It's good to be back. All right, I'll just share my screen. So yeah, um, I'm gonna stop for questions throughout, but if there's anything really pressing that you don't understand, uh, please let me know. So today I'm gonna be talking about social reinforcement learning. Um, so I'm really interested in the problem of trying to train AI agents using reinforcement learning which is this framework for thinking about AI agents, which is interactive. So the agent is interacting with an environment, deciding how to take actions, and then observing the reward that it receives after its actions and how the environment state changes. And really what its goal is, is to maximize its total expected future reward over the long term. So in contrast to other machine learning algorithms, which just try to make the right prediction, uh, and they're just single time step, like algorithms, reinforcement learning wants to uh, do sequential making, decision making. So make a series of decisions in order to actually maximize the, the, its benefit in the long run. And uh, it's basically done through trial and error learning. So the agent tries to explore the environment to find strategies that work. And then when it finds one, it should try to exploit it. But when to stop exploring and when to exploit is a hard trade off. So I'm going to introduce a little bit of new notation that we're going to need later. So the agent is trying to learn this policy, pi. And we often like to talk about this total expected future reward quantity in terms of Q values. So what a Q value is, it says, this is the total reward I expect to receive if I'm starting in this state and I take this action right now. And then I continue to follow my policy in the future. So that's the idea. Um, and I'm really focused on the case of deep reinforcement learning where you use a deep neural network to basically be the brain of the agent. So that's your policy. And I think deep reinforcement learning is really cool. So you might've heard of some of the really famous successes of deep RL, like AlphaGo, which is the um, model that was able to beat one of the top Go players in the world. And since the game of Go has, you know, more states than there are atoms in the universe, this was considered a pretty big accomplishment. Um, since then, there's been bot bots and models that have beaten top humans in games like StarCraft and Dota. And actually, it's the technology that's behind how we got this, 
you know, robotic hand to be able to manipulate this Rubik's cube. And you can see here, there's also uh, this whole arm farm of robotic arms learning to manipulate objects using RL. And I think if we actually want something like robotics to scale up and be deployed broadly in the world, we are going to need something like RL because it's really just talking about how that robot can make a series of decisions in what it's doing. Like picking up an object actually involves a sequence of decisions and optimizing that is something that RL is made to do. So I think DeepRL is really cool, but it also has all kinds of problems. So one of the most salient is the computational complexity. So that Go algorithm, that famous Go algorithm, even the more computationally efficient version had to play 4.9 million games of Go to reach the proficiency that it did. So if you imagine that a game of Go takes a human about an hour to play, then this bot played for about 559 years in human playtime. So obviously, we've got the technology where we can throw massive compute at these models and build really scaled up models that can brute force their way into finding uh, really smart algorithms. But is this really the best we can do? I think we could maybe make this a lot more efficient. And then the second problem is generalization. Mm. So what I mean by that is these algorithms are really good at learning what they are trained on. So they can learn to fit the data that you give them during training, but they often fail if there's even a slight modification to the training environment. So if you train it to play this pong game with these colors and you just slightly switch the colors, it's going to utterly fail. So this is obviously not very effective. So how can we do better than that? Well, I want to argue that we could take ideas from social learning that could improve reinforcement learning. So social learning just means learning from other agents that are present in your environment. And it's actually really effective for humans and animals. So even this little one inch fish can use social learning to find safe sources of food when it's dumped into a new environment by looking where other fish have gathered. And similarly, these birds in the UK were able to use social learning to figure out how to open milk top bottles by observing other birds. So it's not that each bird independently figured out how to open the milk top bottles themselves. They use social learning to take cues from other agents to discover this behavior. And uh, for humans, many have argued that what sets us apart from other species is that we've really taken this social learning ability to the next level or to the extreme. And it's social learning that's been the big driver behind our cognitive development, our cultural and technological development. And so, again, I'd like to ask, what could social learning do for RL? Well, we know that individual exploration, which is what RL relies upon, is really expensive and time consuming. So you would never expect to discover something like the Large Hadron Collider by starting with the technology of rubbing two sticks together to make a fire and randomly exploring until you found the Large Hadron Collider. I mean, that idea is almost laughable. But that's actually how we train RL agents. So if you want to get this little half cheetah to learn to walk, what we do is we have it randomly wiggle around until it stumbles upon something that starts making forward progress, and then it can optimize for that. So clearly, this is super inefficient. And the other problem with individual exploration is it's dangerous. So I was actually able to dig up a picture of a robot getting hit by a car on the internet which I think ended up being staged, but doesn't matter. The point is the same. If we wanted a robot to be able to explore our human environments, that would actually be pretty dangerous. It could wander onto a road and it could get hit by a car. But in contrast, if it could use social learning to guide its exploration to safe parts of the environment where humans were walking, then we know that it could explore safely. So I think these are pretty clear benefits. So basically, I'm gonna argue that social learning could help RL agents learn more complex behavior and faster, adapt better to new environments, so fix that generalization problem. And obviously, it could improve human AI interaction because we could learn from humans um, how to interact more effectively with them. And then, of course, it could improve the ability to coordinate with other agents. So that's exactly what my talk is going to be about. I'm going to survey a few different works on these different topics, and I'll try to pause between each one so you guys can ask questions. So the first, I'm just going to talk about how to do social learning from other agents and from humans. Then I'm going to talk about using multi-agent competition as a way to spur learning and improve generalization. And then finally, if I have enough time, I'll talk about a method for improving cooperation and coordination between agents. So let's talk about social learning from other agents. 
But first, I want to set up that this is not the same as just doing copying or imitation learning. Mm. So in imitation learning, you're given a curated data set of expert trajectories. So you basically say, here's the behavior of an expert we know that's good. Just copy this. But there's a huge problem with this. If the data from the expert is bad, then your performance will also be bad because all you're doing is copying it exactly. And the second problem is that you can't generalize actually even worse in RL because uh, you're only copying the data that you've seen. So if during um, test time, you ever stray off of the area where you've seen data, you have no idea what to do. So the policies are brittle and they don't generalize effectively. So I'm more interested in this like naturalistic multi-agent RL setting. So imagine like you're an autonomous driving, you're autonomous car, you're trying to learn how to drive. Um, and so basically you're on the road and you can see other agents, but they're not necessarily motivated to teach you. And they may or may not have relevant expertise. So if you're trying to figure out how to navigate a roundabout, maybe some other car knows how to do it, but another car might be a bad driver and you actually don't want to be learning from them. So the idea is, you don't have to copy all the other cars exactly. You can actually improve upon their policy, but you do have to identify which experts are relevant and try to learn from them. And then the idea behind social learning is that you could actually learn how to acquire information from other agents. So instead of just copying, you can learn a policy for how to learn from others. And this can allow you to adapt to new environments. So let me explain what I mean by that. So. This was a project I did with a student where we're studying whether agents in a multi-agent environment that's partially observed that do not have privileged access to the states and actions of other agents can learn effectively from them. And it turns out, no, they can't. They're pretty dumb. So if you look at this graph, what we're showing is the performance of agents that were trained by themselves in pink and the performance of agents that were trained in the presence of an expert that was actively demonstrating how to do the task over and over again and there's no difference between them. So basically these model freight RL agents are not learning from experts at all. They're so much dumber than our little fish. So why is that? Well, it turns out that the way RL works is, as I mentioned, it's really focused on optimizing its total expected reward. So it's very greedy. If something happens that doesn't affect the agent's reward, it basically doesn't encode it. So you imagine you're in this door key environment and you're this red agent and you're trying to learn how to pick up the key use it to unlock the door and go find that goal. The blue agent is an expert. So it's actively demonstrating that, hey, look, this door opens. Maybe you could try going through it. But because the red agent doesn't benefit from that and doesn't get any reward, it's just not going to encode that at all. So for example, in policy gradients, this is the loss function for how you compute the gradient to train the model. If the reward is zero, the gradient is zero. It's not encoding anything about this expert demonstration. So in order to fix that in this project, we just did something really simple, which is we just augmented our normal RL agent with this additional auxiliary loss that asks it to predict the next state that it sees. And why this helps is because in order to predict the next state, the agent has to accurately predict what the other agent is going to do because the other agent is in its field of view. So now it's starting to encode something about the other agent's policy. It's using that to update its model and it can benefit from the other agent's demonstration. So the simple augmentation allowed our agents to reach um, actually most of the time better than expert performance, so improve upon the expert performance. And on average, it was the same as imitation learning. And this is kind of nice because the social learners don't require privileged access to other agent states, so they could be deployed in more realistic settings. But I still think that's not very interesting. Maybe you're just saying this is a much harder way to get the same performance as imitation learning. But actually, here's the cool part. So remember how I said RL agents don't generalize to stuff that they weren't trained on? Well, here we're testing exactly that. We're testing them in new environments that look different from the training environment. So they've never seen something like a maze, but we're asking how well they can perform in navigating a maze. And we see that imitation learners, which is the green bar on the rightmost part of the plot, perform very poorly. So they don't really generalize effectively as we expected. And the original experts that the, that the social learners learn from are the orange bars. And again, they don't generalize very well, but the purple social learners actually generalize pretty effectively. So that's showing that they're able to figure out how to use their social learning policy to acquire information from other agents in the new environment. So now you're in a new environment with a new task with a new expert, 
that you can figure out what that expert is doing and therefore learn to do the task. So this, we've already seen that even a simple social learning method can help with rapidly adapting to new environments and learning more complex behavior. But that method was pretty simple. So we can actually improve on that pretty significantly. So now we're in the setting where again, we're training our main agent, we're calling it an ego agent with RL. But we have access to data from other agents, like how they did the task. And we chose to model this with successor features. So if you remember that Q function I was talking about, that's really critical in RL. Successor features break, breaks it down into two parts a psi and a w. The psi is basically saying, what do I think this policy is going to do in the future? So it's kind of some state features that I expect the policy to accumulate over time. So imagine that I was an RL agent and I'm in a foraging environment where I could pick up apples and bananas. What psi might do is count how many apples it thinks the policy is going to pick up and how many bananas. And then the w is a preference vector over those features. So it just says like, do I want to pick up bananas or do I want to pick up apples? Um, and the reason that this breakdown is useful, we figured out for multi-agent learning, is what you can do is you can say, okay, I learned the psi for all the other agents, which is basically how they're going to behave. What if I, instead of using their preference vector, I combine it with my preference vector. So I say, look, I really want to pick, pick up bananas and policy number two over there is going to pick up 17 bananas but I'm only gonna pick up 15 bananas. So why don't I just act like policy number two? So then at test time, I can basically borrow the policies I'm learning from other agents if I've figured out that they will actually benefit me. So I can use my learning from others to take better actions. But the second thing we do that's kind of neat is we build both our own psi and the other agent's psi out of the same shared underlying feature representation. So the sides are like this accumulated feature representation over time. And that uh, feature representation phi is shared. And so what that lets us do is when we learn from agent two, it improves our learning of agent one. And when we learn from ourselves, it improves our modeling of other agents. And specifically, when we use RL to get rewards from the environment, we can actually update that psi. And then that actually improves our ability to model these other agents. So now we've got this nice feedback loop. The more we interact with the environment, the better representation we have of the environment, which allows us to model the other agents, and the better we model them, the more we can steal from them and use their cool techniques. So we tested this model um, in some different environments, including some uh, simulated driving environments. And we found that our model outperforms both RL methods and imitation learning methods in these multitask environments with experts that may or may not be relevant to the task. And the cool thing is it comes with like side benefits for free. So we can now also model other agents and predict what they're going to do more effectively than baseline methods. And we can do inverse RL, which is where we try to infer what the reward function the other agent is optimizing and then optimize for that ourselves. And we uh, can do better than state of the art methods in that domain. Um, and finally, my favorite thing is that this also improves generalization. So, okay, imagine that you're an uh, imitation learning agent and during training, you've only ever had to pick up bananas. How long would it take you to learn to pick up apples? Well, it turns out for a state of the art method, it takes you like a hundred episodes to be able to do that. But in contrast with sci-fi learning, even if you've only ever picked up apples, but you've seen another agent picking up uh, bananas, you can adapt almost instantly to picking up bananas. So you've never done it yourself, but you've seen someone else do it, you can figure it out. So it improves generalization and gets us like one step closer to that little fish. So that was about um, learning from other RL agents and we can see, or simulated agents. We can see that, okay, it does help us rapidly adapt and it does help us learn more complex behavior. But what about learning from humans? Humans are the smartest agent around. Why shouldn't we try to learn from them? And I'm particularly interested in this because I did my PhD in the affective computing group. And the focus of that group is all about trying to predict human emotion and social signals. And so we actually have gotten pretty good at that. Like I would say we have pretty accurate predictors of facial expressions, pretty accurate predictors of sentiment and text. So then I started asking myself, okay, so we can predict somebody's facial expressions. Well, what can we learn from that? What can we do with that? And so what I'm interested in doing is trying to use those signals in order to teach RL agents how to have better interactions with humans. So. Here's an example of a real conversation that a person had with their Alexa. 
They say, Alexa, what's the right way to Walmart? And Alexa says, the right way to spell Walmart is W-A-L blah, blah, blah. This is clearly not what the user wanted. So I would bet you that the next thing that they say um, is going to contain some hint of frustration. So maybe it's their tone of voice or their facial expression, but there's some clue there that Alexa did the wrong thing and she could improve on doing that. So I would argue that using these kind of signals is gonna work better than providing explicit feedback. Um, so I don't know if anyone's willing to write in the chat, but how many people have ever bothered to provide feedback to Google to train their algorithm to be better? If no one typed anything, I'm gonna assume no one has ever done it. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't think many people bother to do that. But in contrast, and I won't make you fess this up, I sent it wrong information to take down the man. Nice, okay. Um, okay, but okay, in contrast, and I won't make you confess this, how many people have ever used like a bit of a tone with their Alexa or their Siri, <laughs> right? This comes for free. This is something you might just do automatically without even thinking about it. So the, the signal is there and we can learn from it. So that's the idea behind a couple of this work. So I did a first work on this was just experimenting with learning from facial expressions. So we had this generative model that draws sketches. We showed the sketches to people and monitored their facial expressions. And then we used that data to fine tune our model to search for uh, sketches that would make the user smile more and frown less. And we saw that with only a few samples, we can change the way it, it draws. So this is the way it used to draw cats. You can see that sometimes it draws a nice cat, but sometimes it's like a little more abstract. And with only 70 samples of facial expression data, we changed it to draw significantly cuter cats. Um, and so whether, you know, cuter cats are a great scientific achievement, I'm not sure. Um, but let's look at how we actually change the rhinoceros model. So, yeah, I don't know what this is, but I don't think it's a rhinoceros. And yet with, again, only a very few samples, we were able to get a model that consistently draws something that looks a lot more like a rhinoceros. So we think this was actually the first work that showed you can improve something like a generative model with facial expression. Um, and then more recently, I've been working on trying to improve dialogue models or chatbots. So the insight is that as the user is talking to the bot, if it says something like that didn't make sense, we can detect that that is a negative sentiment and they are not enjoying the conversation. So the model should not do this again. And similarly, if you say, if the conversation is going well, then that's a reward that can incentivize the model to keep talking like this. So in order to enable this research, we built this online platform where we had these dialogue models running on GPU, talking to people on the internet. And we included in the interface a way for users to upvote and downvote uh, the specific utterances that people, the bot was saying. But we hypothesized that that isn't going to scale as well as learning from these implicit metrics like the sentiment that we can detect. So in order to learn from this, we first had to decide, OK, what uh, signals actually correlate with whether humans are enjoying the conversation? So after combing through the literature from both the dialogue model community and the psychology literature on what makes an empathetic and good conversation, we came up with these rewards that seem to correlate strongly with um, people enjoying the conversation. And they included getting the user to laugh, eliciting positive sentiment from the user, not being too repetitive, and staying on topic by maximizing things like word similarity. So we wanted our model to learn to optimize these with reinforcement learning. Um, and it's kind of unconventional. Instead of being able to train in a simulated environment where I can do a million samples, I now want to train in with a human user. So I can't just, it's not a video game. I have to actually get data from the human. But wait, did I just say I was going to put like bots on the internet and have them learn from humans about how to talk? I think we've seen that that can go pretty badly. Um, so maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we actually need to carefully test our model before we put it back online. So we want to collect our data and train offline. But this actually means we're breaking the traditional uh, reinforcement interacting, interaction loop. And this actually turns out to be a pretty hard problem called offline or batch RL. And it means doing RL where you can't explore in the environment. And that's actually really hard because most RL algorithms are optimistic in the face of uncertainty. 
So if they don't know the value of something, they want to go there and explore it. Well, look how well that works in this uh, example. So pretend I'm this cute little agent. I'm trying to learn to go to that red flag, but I've only been given a batch of data um, that's shown in yellow. So the probability of something being in the batch is yellow. So if it's white, I've never seen this data before. Now, what happens if I get randomly initialized to think that going left from this state is a good idea? Well, we know that it's optimistic in the face of uncertainty, so it's gonna to wanna to explore that, but it can't. And so that high value that it thinks uh, is good for the state is just gonna actually propagate into all the previous states that could lead to this because we're estimating this total expected future reward all over time. And so these bad values propagate into all of our other values and basically the estimates in offline RL can be arbitrarily bad. So the way we solved that in this paper was with a KL constraint. And what that means is we just said that the bot had to try to learn a policy within what's probable under the batch. And then it can kind of look within that space to find the optimal policy. So just to put that in math very quickly, what that means is we took our normal RL loss and added a constraint such that the RL policy can't deviate too much from what is probable under the batch. And for language, what is probable under the batch just looks like a language model. It just says, if that's a crazy, unnatural, not English looking sentence, then you shouldn't be doing that. So you can check the paper for more details, but let's check out how well it worked. So we see that this beats prior offline RL methods in normal uh, RL environments, but how does it work in dialogue? So we see that if you don't do that, this is what RL does. It starts using really unrealistic language. It says, where did you say to me? You want to talk to you about you? So it's just gotten really unrealistic. It's off in that crazy, you know, nothingness zone of bad values, and it doesn't know how to get out of there because it can't refine its estimates. So it's just exploiting the reward function by asking a lot of questions because that's an easy part of the reward, and it's not being very interesting. In contrast, when we add the KL constraint, but we're still optimizing for rewards like eliciting positive sentiment and making the user happy, then we see that the model changes to say something like, hey, I hope you have a great day and I wish you the best. So we notice that it's not only realistic, but it got a lot more cheerful, polite, and supportive. So we think we've basically come up with an objective to make bots sound Canadian. So that's nice. Um, but in summary, we did test our models against the baselines with a set of novel humans on the internet. And we found that not only do they elicit significantly more positive sentiment and laughter from those humans, but they're also rated better by the humans. And what's nice is when we compare how optimizing for each of the reward functions in isolation performs, we see that um, sentiment, optimizing for sentiment, leads to the highest quality and human reward, which means that affect is important in a good conversation. So keeping my affective computing advisor very happy. Um, and we do see, as we hypothesize, that optimizing for those manual upvotes um, is not scaling as well as optimizing for these implicit signals. All right, so I'll just say one more bit about this and then I'll stop for questions. So um, this is a project we did as a follow-up with a student. Um, so we wanted to train our model using rewards at the sentence level, kind of planning over sentences rather than just receiving rewards at the word level. And we found that that was much more effective at optimizing for different functions. So the baseline is kind of dumb. It says things like, I don't know what that means. Um, if you optimize for sentiment, we've already seen that it does sound very positive. I'm in a sunroom. It's a great feeling. Um, it can ask questions. We've seen that. Uh, it can learn not to repeat itself. So this is a nice example of a conversation where, you know, it says it's a reservoir engineer and it's on its first day of vacation. Um, it can optimize for semantic similarity to what the user is saying. So when the user asks, um, says, I listen to Ed Sheeran, the bot says, what genre is it? Uh, any recommendations? And then finally, I think this is really important. Um, these models and the large scale models that people are training in industry context are trained on large scale data from the internet, including Reddit. So they actually can sometimes say pretty toxic comments. And so what we did was we built a toxicity detector and uh, used RL to train the model to not output anything toxic. And so we can show that we reduced the amount of toxic language that it uses. So I think this example is just cute. You know, the user tells the bot that it's stupid and it just says, you're cute, I hate you, but I don't know why. 
So that's a fun example. But in summary for this part of the work, we were the first to propose using KL control from a pre-trained prior as an offline RL algorithm. Um, we use reinforcement learning to prove based on human feedback. We find that implicit signals like sentiment are better than explicit butt impresses. And you can learn to optimize for any metric you like to code up, um, which can be useful for things like reducing toxicity. All right, so I'm gonna pause here for a couple seconds to take some questions if anybody has. But I can also keep going. We can save your questions to the end. Um, or if you just want to type in the chat, that's good too. All right, I'm going to keep going. But if you think of a question, feel free to type it. Um, OK, so the next part is some newer work that I'm excited about. And this is the idea of using multi-agent competition to improve learning and generalization. So if you remember, the problems I said RL has are that it takes too many samples to learn, and it doesn't generalize well. So um, the way that uh, we past work has uh, tried to improve generalization is just saying, look, the model is only going to learn what's in the simulator. So let's just make the simulator cover more stuff. So if we have a simulator of a robotic hand, let's just randomize all the parameters of the hand so that that randomized distribution covers the things we might encounter in the real world. And this is called domain randomization. And it has been very successful. It was successful in this ro robotic hand, but it does have problems. So, so we can show that even in very simple environments, domain randomization may not work. So here we have this blue agent. It's trying to navigate to a green goal. And we're using domain randomization to randomize the position of all of the blocks. Um, and we train on a series of these environments. And then we test on this four rooms environment, which actually has walls. So can anybody guess what's going to happen in the four rooms environment? Well, probably I wouldn't be asking if it was good, right? So um, the model, the, the if it starts in the same room, it can find the goal. But otherwise, it hasn't figured out how to be able to walk around walls. So even though walls are something that could be within the random distribution, you could expect to randomly sample a wall, that doesn't happen often enough for it to actually learn to deal with walls. So we can see that domain randomization is breaking down even in this very simple environment. So if that's true, how well do we really hope to work in the real world? And even if you say like, look, I could use domain randomization to get a robot to learn to walk upstairs by randomly perturbing the size of the stairs or the width of the stairs or the texture or something like that. The problem is that in the real world, there's so many different types of stairs. You're never going to be able to randomly generate all of this complexity. So how can you possibly think that this approach is going to be able to scale to real world robotics? So what we really need is a way to create a series of complex training environments that cover unknown real world test cases so that we're prepared for whatever we might encounter in the real world. But we don't want to have to program all of those cases ourselves into the simulator by hand because we're just going to miss stuff. It's going to be too hard. It's brittle. It's not going to work. So maybe we can make this problem more multi-agent and that will solve it. So what you could imagine doing is saying, okay, I'm trying to learn this player agent policy here, but what if I also learn a policy to set the parameters of the environment to make the life of my player agent harder and therefore challenge it and make it learn more effectively and make it more robust. So can anybody see what might happen if I have this adversary that's trying to minimize the performance of the player? I should say that Minimax works really good for like self-play. That's been very successful. What's going to happen if the, the minimizer can build the environment? So you might see what's happened. It's made the environment impossible. So yeah, exactly. It makes it impossible. Thanks, Luke. Yeah. So basically, the agent can't learn. There's no opportunity to learn. It can't get a reward. So this is just wasting training time. It's making the training even worse. So what we need is kind of a more elegant way to ensure that the adversary does not create impossible environments. But ideally, we also want those, the environment to be tailored to the current skill level of the agent. So just outside what it's able to do. So we've already seen that making problems more multi-agent seems to help. So what if we just add even more agents? So this is actually the idea behind um, the algorithm that we developed recently. 
So instead of just having an adversary build an environment for a single player, we're going to add a second player that's going to constrain the adversary. So we call our, our player, uh, our central player now a protagonist, and we add in this antagonist agent. And now the adversary's goal is to maximize the regret, which is the difference between their performance. And so what it's doing is saying, it's still trying to minimize the protagonist score. So still making it more robust, finding cases where it fails, exploiting its weaknesses, but it's constrained by, it has to pick problems where at least the antagonist can get a high score. So the problem should be in principle feasible and probably easy because both agents are initialized together and are training at the same time. So we call this approach protagonist antagonist induced regret environment design, which is a huge mouthful, but we think paired accurately describes how we're using this pair of agents. And the cool thing is we were able to show that this relates to some 50 year old literature on decision, actually 70 year old literature on decision theory. Um, so we can show that domain randomization is basically equivalent to the principle of insufficient reason. The minimax adversary is the maxi min principle and paired is minimax regret. And so we uh, introduced a new formalism, which we called unsupervised environment design. And I won't bore you with the details. We talked about an underspecified POM DP, which basically just says you have an additional set of parameters which turn it from underspecified to specified. So the underspecified POM DP would be like all possible navigation environments, and the specified POM DP would be the position of blocks in that environment. And then you can define a policy that uh, sets those parameters. And depending on how you do that, you recover each of these original methods. All right, so we were able to show that if you define this as a two-player game where the adversary and the antagonist are allied against the protagonist, then if it reaches a Nash equilibrium, the protagonist will be playing the minimax regret policy. So we can show it's minimax regret. But why is that cool? Well, minimax regret turns out to be a great objective for getting an automatic curriculum. So I'm gonna claim that regret incentivizes the adversary to create the easiest possible environment that the protagonist cannot yet solve. So why is that? Well, let's assume that the antagonist is optimal. Regret is actually normally the difference between uh, the optimal agent and the protagonist. So if the antagonist is optimal, then it's getting the perfect score. Now we're trying to minimize the protagonist score. So we basically want that second term to go to zero. So we're just trying to maximize the first term while keeping the second term at zero. In most RL environments, um, there's a time step penalty. So the longer you take to complete the task, the lower your reward is. So therefore, in order to maximize the first term, you wanna make the shortest possible environment that the protagonist can't solve. So that means, of course, your regret for failing to do an easy task is higher than your regret for failing to do a hard task. So that's why this works to generate an automatic curriculum. So the adversary is motivated to propose tasks in the protagonist's zone of proximal development, basically what's just outside its current range of skill level. All right, so that was a lot of talk. Let's actually see how well this works. So as we mentioned, domain randomization, uh, you know, generates unstructured environments. So you can learn with this, but you're gonna waste a lot of computation. It's gonna take a lot of samples to get to something interesting. Minimax adversary makes impossible environments. So you, you can't really learn. Paired is our Goldilocks. It makes difficult structured environments. You can see this has like a hallway in it that's challenging, but um, they are possible to solve. And so when we look at the performance of these different uh, models over training, we see that the environments generated by paired have significantly uh, higher shortest path length, and the agents are uh, learning to solve mazes with higher shortest path length. And that's quite, quite interesting because nobody was trained on an objective of path length at all. That just emerged from the objectives that we used. So we think of this as a, an emergent complexity phenomenon. Um, and then of course, my favorite part, we can show that this improves generalization. So we test on a set of um, environments that were never presented during training, but represent difficult tasks, such as this labyrinth or this maze. And we see that as the complexity of the transfer task increases, so does the performance gap between um, paired and the baseline method. And for extremely complex tasks, only paired has sort of any hope of solving it. So once again, we think this is promising results that multi-agent can lead to increasing generalization. But um, 
I think we want to talk about, does this have any real world applications? So actually, when I first started at Google, there was some talk that I might have to do some work that, you know, relates to a product. But, you know, I didn't know how my multi-agent grid worlds were really going to help Google, you know, sell ads or whatever. But luckily, I was put in touch with this team that is interesting in a really interesting problem, which is how can I get an agent that would navigate website for me? So what if I want to be able to say, okay, Google, buy me a keyboard. And it just navigates Best Buy's website and buys that for me. Or, okay, Google, book me a flight to Los Angeles on Friday. So we want this agent that can complete these web navigation tasks. But the problem is it's really hard to do that. Those are very hard, complex sequence decision-making problems. And so what the team at Google was doing was actually hand programming a curriculum of easy, medium, and hard tasks. And you can see that actually they weren't even get the, able to get the agent to learn these hardest tasks. So we thought, hey, maybe Paired could help generate a nice curriculum of web pages for the agents to solve. And we found that actually, yes, it could. So um, this is a picture of an adversary parameterized to build websites. And you can see that early in training, it keeps the pages very simple um, with only a couple of elements per page. But late in training, it makes long forms with many elements that the, the agent has to navigate. And then we test on a set of standardized web navigation environments. And we show that um, our agent, it does much better than prior work. Um, we propose new methods to improve paired that include like an explicit difficulty incentive and it beats things like schedule, curriculum, domain randomization, and actually the original paired. And it's actually four times better than the previous state of the art on these web navigation tasks. So we think that's really exciting. So in conclusion, we think unsupervised environment design is a good way to improve transfer and generalization. We think paired is a good idea for a UED because by constraining the adversary with the performance of the second agent, it ensures the adversary creates feasible but challenging environments. And we think regret is a good objective for automatic curriculum generation. All right, so I'm going to pause here because that was the end of this section. So any questions on this section? I'm going to go back and answer Jordan's question on the other section, which was on Reddit and toxicity connection. I, I don't know if this is a joke, but okay, it's actually real. Um, you can unmute yourselves too. Feel free to talk. Um, yeah, so large scale internet data has been shown to contain significant biases. Um, so language models, for example, trained on just massive amounts of data from the internet exhibit sexist biases, racist biases, um, and it is a big problem. And so it's an active area of research of how to uh, combat this. Um, you can do things like de-bias the model mathematically, but I actually am worried that it's not totally sufficient. So when I was training those dialogue models, I actually had the model say something like, um, I'm a woman, so I don't understand, or something like that. And the interesting thing about that is, there's no single word in that sentence that's toxic or unacceptable. So it's pretty hard to filter that out or learn not to say that. Almost solving that problem would be AI complete, right? To, to really understand how not to say that you have to understand the language, which I don't think we've really arrived at a model that truly understands language. Um, so yeah, that's a tangent, but it's an interesting problem. If Reddit is bad, I can see what 4chan, yeah, well, yeah. How many QAnon AIs has Google accidentally created? Yeah, I don't think Google was to blame for a QAnon AI. They're pretty careful, but I think, you know, it is something to think about. Like these large scale models trained on internet data are being deployed into stuff. Um, yeah. Any other questions? All right, I'm gonna zoom through this last bit of the talk. I may skip a couple things to give us more time to talk at the end. Um, so the last part is on improving cooperation and coordination. And what we wanted to do is create a method to train agents to coordinate with each other, but they wanna be able to train them independently. So something that could work for real world settings. So what we came up with is to give agents an intrinsic social motivation for having a causal influence on each other's actions. So why that? Why actions? 
Well, if you can learn from just observing other agents' actions, you don't need to observe their reward function, which is good because if you're training something like an autonomous car, if I'm training the Tesla car, there's no way it can observe the proprietary reward function of the Waymo car, but it can observe whether that car turns left. So we just think it's more realistic for real world settings. But then why this causal influence thing? That seems weird. Well, as we'll show, this is related to rewarding the mutual information between agents' actions. So we have the hypothesis that this will lead agents towards learning coordinated behavior. So we create causal influence by having agents um, learn a model of other agents. So basically, I just learned a model that says uh, I'm able to predict what you will do in the next time step condition on my action in the previous time step. And then I can use that to simulate counterfactual actions. So I can ask myself, what do I predict this other agent B would do if I had taken this other action instead? And by using those counterfactuals, I can actually assess the causal influence of my actions on the other agent. So I can sample a bunch of them and sum over them to kind of get agent B's marginal policy or default policy, like what it would do if it weren't considering me at all. And then the difference between, or the divergence between that marginal policy of agent B and the policy of agent B conditioned on my action is the causal influence of my action on agent B. And you can't always say that, but the reason it's causal in this case is we can draw the causal diagram that shows that um, the path between my action at time step T and agent B's action at time step T plus one, um, th the only causal path is this one because you can't have a causal path through unconditioned on collider nodes, a little bit of detail there, but trust me, it is causal. But even if it wasn't, that's actually not the point. The main point is we're gonna give this as a reward to agent A, and we think that this will help agent A learn coordinated behavior because we can show that it's related to rewarding the mutual information. So I'll skip this in the interest of time, but just trust me that um, in expectation, this is maximizing mutual information between agents' actions. So we think it could lead them to learn to coordinate. Um, but there is a problem. So, okay, I just said, I'm gonna give an agent an action for causing another agent to do something differently. Can anybody see a problem with that? Troll AIs, yeah, exactly. So um, if I just get a reward for kind of messing with you, I could just do something really simple, like get in your way. You have to walk around me. I've influenced you, but in not in a good way. So it's not necessarily beneficial. So we take two uh, approaches for overcoming this problem and this work. And the first is just to test this method in environments where cooperation is exactly the hard problem. So we're looking at tragedy of the commons environments where, for example, these agents are trying to eat these delicious apples, but if they consume the apples too quickly, they won't grow back. So every agent greedily wants to eat as many apples as it can. But of course, if all agents follow that strategy, they all get bad reward. Um, so I won't, I'll skip some details, but suffice it to say, if you do add the influence reward, the collectively, the agents get higher return, which in these environments should be evidence that they're cooperating because they're not trained to maximize everyone else's return, just to maximize their selfish return. So how is maximizing influence helping them all collectively do better? So if we look into this, this is super interesting. What we see is in this environment, um, the purple agent was trained with the influence reward. And we can see that it's behaving a little bit differently than the other agents. So when there are no apples around, the other agents keep moving and keep searching for apples, but the purple agent actually stays still. So why does it do that? Well, it's actually learned to only ever move when there's food present. So what that allows it to do is gain influence over other agents because the world is partially observed. So in this case, in this example, this yellow agent can only see what's in this red box. So it can't see that there's this delicious apple just above it. But when the influence ag influencer agent moves, which it only ever does if there is an apple, that reliably signals to the yellow agent that there's food there and changes the yellow agent's intended behavior. So the purple agent has now gained influence. And we see this happening again. Here, this pink agent, um, it has to clean the river before the apples will appear, and the apples will appear outside of its field of view. So when the purple agent chooses to stay still, then it signals that there are no apples, 
And again, the pink agent changes its intended behavior and there's a moment of influence. So this is really interesting. The influencer agent basically learned to use its actions to communicate about the presence of food in order to gain influence. So why didn't it learn to be a troll? So what we think is that because the purple agent, because the influencer is trying to maximize its own reward as well, it doesn't want to go too far out of its way just to mess with the other agents. It wants to be able to pick up apples, but still gain influence. So we think that learning to communicate the information that it already had was maybe one of the cheaper ways to gain influence while still um, obtaining its own reward. So this was quite interesting. Obviously, we decided, hey, let's train the agent to actually explicitly communicate using this influence reward. So now we give agents a cheap talk channel. So they can basically babble symbols onto this shared channel that the other agents can see. Um, and the other agents don't have to listen to what you put on the channel. That's why it's called cheap talk. Um, and we train the agents to how, on how to communicate using the influence reward. And this is the second way that we overcome this problem of troll AIs. So we hypothesize that the only way you can gain influence through a cheap talk channel is if you provide some valuable information that causes the other agent to update its policy. And the reason is, if it doesn't help the other agent gain its own reward, why should it listen to you? It doesn't have to, right? So you have to provide interesting information in order to gain influence. Um, and so we know that cheap talk between self-interested agents doesn't work. So theoretically, we know that as their interests diverge, the amount of information they share goes to zero. And empirically, we know this as well. Um, but we see that when we add the influence reward, uh, not only do they achieve higher collective returns, but they start learning more meaningful communication protocols. And then this is actually my favorite result, which shows the amount of influence between the agents on the left and the agents, um, or, or sorry, the agents on the vertical axis and the agents on the horizontal axis. So you can see that, for example, in the middle figure, agent three is heavily influenced by many other agents. It's sort of a better listener, if you will. And it also tends to get the highest reward in the environment. So actually this relationship was very stable across many different environments um, and many different hyperparameter settings. So agents that were more easily influenced were able to collect more reward in the environment. So we think this supports our hypothesis that they're being influenced by being passed valuable information that helps them maximize their reward. All right, so just quickly wrap up. Whether, as we discussed, whether influencing someone's actions is pro-social or benefits them is gonna depend on the environment. We think communication was a cheap way for agents to gain influence while maximizing their own reward. And then um, influence on self-interested agents via cheap talk should benefit the listener, but actually this depends on the agents interacting repeatedly. If somehow there was a protocol in which agents could lie to a new agent and then never see that agent again, they could potentially gain influence um, without benefiting the listener. But if you, excuse me, if you try to do that with someone that you'll see again, they'll stop listening to you and you'll lose influence over time. So it's a bad idea. So um, in conclusion, we think of social influence as a unified method for promoting coordination and communication in multi-agent settings. And it allows agents to learn socially from each other, but still train independently. So unlike prior work in multi-agent deep RL, which uses a centralized controller or lets everyone see each other's rewards, our method um, allows agents to be trained independently. So it's more realistic for something like autonomous drive. All right, so that's the end of the talk. I've talked about how social reinforcement learning can help agents learn more complex behavior, adapt to new environments and improve human AI interaction and coordinate with other agents. All right, so I'd love to take questions if anyone has them. Uh, hey, Natasha. Um, hey. Uh, so actually, I wanted to go back a little bit to you had the team at Google that was looking at how to navigate websites. Uh, yeah. Is that, yeah. Is, is that paper available somewhere? Uh, yes, for free? it is. Yep, um, it is available for free. It's called um, Learning to Navigate Adversarial uh, Adversarial Environment Generation for Learning to Navigate the Web. Okay. So you can kind of see the paper here. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat. Have you given thought about the people experience around autonomous stuff and things? Um, the autonomous thingy might be trained to maneuver the world safely, but if I'm beside the thingy, how do I know I can be safe from harm? Um, if I'm smiling at a car coming at me, it might be a nervous smile for sure. Um, I'm not going to trust Tesla or Google and they like to have my best interest and safety in mind. 
putting my tinfoil cap back on. Well, that's interesting. I think actually Google would definitely have your safety in mind because of the massive PR cost to having an accident. So I don't know if you've seen like what happened with Uber and Tesla. Um, I think that's really set them back when they have any kind of accident. Um, but yeah, I mean, learning from other drivers on the road is quite tricky. There's some interesting work out of Berkeley. You can look it up. Um, Anka Dragon has this paper, which is like, if the RL agent becomes uncertain about what to do, what should it do then? Actually, maybe it should look at what the other drivers are doing and copy them. So for example, if an ambulance is coming, that's kind of an unusual situation, but you would see all the other cars pulling over to the side of the road. So you could say, I don't know what to do, but I see that everyone else is pulling over, so I'll pull over. So that's kind of an interesting bias. I think learning from other agents in the car setting is gonna look more like the first things I talked about in the talk, rather than like learning from facial expressions. But actually, you know, facial expressions might be useful, for example, telling if a pedestrian is about to walk into the street or not might be a reliable cue. <clears throat> Have you interacted with any human evolutionary studies people or evolutionary econ types about the idea that the most easily influenced agents ended up doing better in your models? Mind your work on parochial altruism in small scale societies. No, I have it. Actually, if you have work that I should be reading about this, I'd be very interested. Um, there's some, there's a contingent of people at, for example, DeepMind that are reading evolutionary biologists like um, Kevin Leyland or like people like Joe Henrik that are saying like, oh, you know, social learning is key to human success. That's why we're so smart. That's, you know, intergroup competition led to us getting, you know, evolving much better abilities. But in terms of parochial altruism, I don't know about that connection. So you should send me that. Does this have application things like nanobot swarm learning? <clears throat> yeah. So multi-agent RL definitely does, but I think, you know, or like, I'm not sure about nanobots, but like, let's say you wanted to like control a swarm of drones, or my friend was actually looking into, you want to control a swarm of low cost um, space vehicles. So basically what they're doing with like space is instead of having like single high cost vehicles that are like a single point of failure, let's just launch like a bazillion really low cost um, things, uh, with a like light sail. I don't know if you guys have seen this, um, but imagine you wanted to control like a, a swarm of low cost space objects. You could use multi-agent deep RL, but you probably would just use a centralized controller. So you could then do like centralized training because all the agents that you're interested in are under your control. Um, and so there are many techniques to do that. Myself, I'm a little bit more interested in the setting where the other agents are not in your control. So like autonomous driving. So you might want to think about other agents could be humans. What if we brute force space? Is something only programmers could think of. <laughs> Check out the light sail thing, man. It's really cool. I don't know if you've seen it. Would this have any application in large language models? Um, so yes. So there are many applications to large language models. So as I mentioned, the whole dialogue project is, is basically trying to improve a language model with human feedback. Um, the hierarchical RL paper is trying to improve a language model with RL, maybe to reduce toxicity, which I think should be very relevant. We should care about that. Um, the other thing is people are really interested in combining large language models with, for example, vision um, or like um, computer vision, like images. And that's actually a project I've been working on. I didn't put a future work slide, but I'm interested in this, which is doing something like paired where you generate tasks uh, to maximize regret or challenge the agent, but the tasks are in the form of language instructions. So you um, you can have this like visually complex environment where an agent is trying to navigate say a house and it has instructions like, go past the sink and turn at the red towel and go down the hallway or something like that. Um, and you could actually adversarially generate instructions to make sure the agent is more robust and can understand many different types of natural language instructions. So that's something I'm working on now. Any, any suggestions where to look for AI learning within or using video games? Yeah, so there's a rich literature on that. Um, I guess I would start with like the, if you're interested, you might want to see the like StarCraft paper. So if you just Googled like um, Alpha Star, that's the DeepMind thing. 
or you could look up the OpenAI 5, which is their um, model that played Dota. And just message me if you have more questions about that, because I'm happy, like offline, I can help steer you in the right direction. Great. Well, okay. thanks again, Natasha. That's been it's been a great talk and very interesting. And it's great to hear about your work. Well, thanks and, for having uh, me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, your uh, pleasure is all ours. Um, Okay, so please keep your eyes open for the next event in fall. And um, we'll say good night and take care everyone and stay well. <laughs>